I'm Rebecca from Reading the Pattern, and I'm here to tell you that Min Farshaw is not a lamp. Now, you may be wondering, what on earth does this mean? Or think, well, duh. Either way, let me explain. This video sums up my response to a lot of the criticisms I've seen fairly consistently in the Wheel of Time fandom about Min and her role in the series. And I do want to say that most of the Min critics that I've heard from, I do really believe are arguing in good faith and usually coming from a place of liking Min and being disappointed in some aspects of her story. So I mean no disrespect to the Min critics, but I am here to argue fiercely against a lot of the criticisms that I've seen and to defend Min to the best of my ability. So be prepared. Now, a quick aside, because I just did a casting video on Min in the Wheel of Time TV show. So a couple little updates to that. One is the actress pronounces her name Kai Alexander, and I either had bad pronunciation or bad accent when I said that the first time. So my apologies. And the second, of course, is that with every new casting, there is, of course, going to be some controversy. And there's one point in particular I did want to bring up because I see a lot of misinformation out there that I do want to try and correct. People seem to think that Kai is too old to play Min, and as part of that, I've seen people claiming an age for her that I don't think is substantiated at all. People keep saying that she's 39. I can't find anything to support that, though supposedly there is one source claiming that, which is very sketchy. What information I can find that I think is more reliable actually points against that, so I'm going to refer to that now. This is from Adam Whitehead, who runs the Wirt Zone blog and is also a contributor for Dragon Mount, and he's someone I consider to be a trustworthy source. So he dug into this and found that she joined the Guildhall School of Drama in 2008, where you have to be at least 18. She graduated three years later and then starred in Bad Education, where she was playing a 15-year-old. Uh, 15 to you know 17 years old over the time that she was there, which ended in 2014. She also met her boyfriend at Guildhall. They graduated at the same time, and he has been identified as age 30. In 2018, she was playing someone age 30. Basically, the best information we have is that she's about 29 or 30 years old, whereas Yosha Stradowski, who is playing Rand, is 25, and per the companion, Min is supposed to be four years older than Rand. I also want to point out that I think a lot of what people are reacting to is simply makeup. I chose these two photos because they're both recent from 2020. And if you compare on the left, where I think she has a fairly minimal makeup look, and the one on the right, where it's more dramatic, I think that dramatic makeup makes for a mature look. Whereas when I've seen her with minimal makeup, she looks very youthful. Maybe go check her out in Collateral, which is streaming on Netflix, which I am doing right now. It's from 2018. She's playing a college student, and I think she looks quite youthful. Having said all that, it really doesn't matter how old she is. What matters is can she play the part? No one who's out there criticizing has seen her audition, has seen her on set. So the other thing to keep in mind is that I don't recall anyone getting all that upset when Alvaro Morte was cast as Loghain, even though he's much older than Loghain is supposed to be. It's a criticism that women are likely to get and men less likely. And so it's really the actress's prerogative to not have her age out there and potentially have it affect her ability to be hired, which it should not. Of course, there's also people who are upset that she is being played by an Asian actress. I've said lots on that topic. It is tiring. But if you are someone who is upset about that, please check out content I have done and content that others have done that have addressed this topic in great depth and detail. Now, let's move on to another controversial topic. Now is the point where I warn you that the rest of this video will contain spoilers for the entire series. So you're going to want to stop here if you haven't finished the series and don't want to be spoiled about plot points. You can check out my spoiler free Min video instead. Now, what does it mean when people say that Min is a lamp? It has to do with something called the sexy lamp test, which is this. If you can remove a female character from your story and replace her with a sexy lamp and it still works, you're a hack. So does Min have any agency or relevancy to the plot of the Wheel of Time or is she just there to be sexy for Rand? 
I'm going to argue that what she does is extremely relevant and that it's reductive to describe even just what she does for Rand in this way. But I've got to break this all down further and take each point that goes into the sexy lamp perspective one by one. A lot of men critics who have shared their perspectives seem in some way bothered by the way that Min seems to change from who she is at the beginning. And one change that's a bit more obvious is the change in the way that she dresses, which could be seen as emblematic of a larger issue. Some female readers who themselves prefer not to dress in a stereotypically feminine way or a way that's acceptable to the male gaze identified with Min and were bothered by this change or her reasons for it. One of the points cited for this argument is that Min specifically does not want to wear dresses after working as a tavern maid as a young woman when she would get pinched. Yikes. So after that, she vows she doesn't want to wear dresses as much as possible. She avoids it and wears boys clothes and wears her hair short. We don't know for sure if the short hair is part of that, but it makes sense. It could be another way for her to make herself less noticeable to men. Here is the main point I want to make on this very thorny issue. Women face a lot of pressure, both subtle and overt, to look a certain way that is acceptable to the male gaze. I think it is a very rare woman indeed who is completely unaffected by that kind of societal pressure. If you are, more power to you. I am not ashamed to admit I spend more time than I would prefer on my hair and makeup when I do these videos. The thing is, I think that Min is reacting to the male gaze, both at the beginning when she wears boys clothes and later on when she develops her own different style. I think initially in Berlon, she's taking the only option available to her to avoid some unwanted male attention, and that's boys clothes. The only other alternative is dresses, and she's just not comfortable in those. That doesn't necessarily mean that boys clothes are her ideal. She is written as a woman who is sexually attracted to men, so it makes sense that she would sometimes want male attention. When she falls for Rand, she does change her style, and I think it is specifically to get him to see her as a woman. What I did like about the way that change was handled is that she sticks to her prohibition against wearing dresses, which clearly make her uncomfortable when she's forced to wear them in the White Tower or for the Shan Chan. She never wears a dress for Rand, which would have been the easiest thing for her to do. Instead, she sort of blazes her own path, creating a style that didn't exist before. And I, I enjoyed her getting to be a trendsetter that way. And to my reading, she created a style that she felt confident in. I understand if you read that a different way. But I would say let's just not pretend that she wasn't affected by the male gaze in the first place before she even met Rand. Let's not pretend it doesn't exist. And let's not pretend that women each have to deal with it in their own way. But let's transition from clothes because that's not even the heart of this question. The change in her clothes is to some readers symbolic of her making choices that go against who she wants to be. Or maybe the question of whether she has choices at all. If her tying herself to Rand is completely out of her hands and 100% to do with the pattern. This goes to the question of whether Min has agency. And it's a tough question because we're talking about a story where the very premise limits the agency of most, if not all, of our main characters. The concept of the pattern, and more specifically that of Taviran, who are woven very tightly in the pattern and who pull nearby threads in their wake means that if you are Taviran or if you're very closely linked to one, you will have a lot less control over your life, at least for a time. If we just look at it that way, Min has no less agency than Rand or Matt or Perrin or Egwene or Nynaeve, etc. She is in a unique situation because she can, through her viewings, see the pattern, she knows from the moment we meet her that she will fall in love with Rand and that she will share him with other women. So when she falls for him, is it real or is it the pattern? I think the only answer in this story is that it's both because that's just the way this world works. Some people seem to have wanted her to struggle against it more. 
And to that, I would say that the choice Robert Jordan made to have men do almost all of the work of accepting her visions and the way they work before we meet her was perhaps a poor one. If we had gone with men on more of her journey of realization that trying to change a vision does not work, those readers might have accepted her falling in love with Rand despite her best intentions. We kind of see this with Avienda, who fights it and fights it and finally accepts it. Personally, I wouldn't have wanted to see Min fight it exactly the way Avienda does, too repetitive. But if we had seen a little bit more of her struggles through her eyes, it might have helped. I do kind of like that Min does understand and accept her abilities and that she makes small choices as she can to try to make things work for her. It does kind of make her stand out in a series where almost everyone is really resisting their destiny. Once she is in love with Rand, some people have an issue with the way she seduces Rand by sitting on his lap and then in the middle part of the series seems to spend a lot of time having sex with him, supporting him, and just basically being his girlfriend. I will agree that in the middle portion of the series where the pacing really slows down a lot and we don't necessarily get a lot of min POVs. There's a good stretch there where she doesn't do a lot. In Crossroads of Twilight and Knife of Dreams, she actually doesn't have any POVs. She's there, but where we see her, it's probably from Rand's POV. Now, I don't blame Min for going after Rand's the way that she did. He was being an idiot and she got what she wanted. But I do think it's unfortunate that Min kind of got forgotten in that middle to late part of the series where Robert Jordan was juggling so many characters. This is the stretch of the story where you actually probably could replace Min with a sexy lamp in a lot of the scenes. That said, I don't accept that just because she did fall by the wayside for part of the series, that that means we should overlook everything else that she does do. So very briefly, I'm going to go through all the major things that she does early in the series, and later I'll talk about how her arc ends. Min chooses to go to Toman Head with her friends, where she ends up acting as a servant to the Shan Chan in order to provide encouragement to Egwene in her captivity and to gather intel, which is used in the plan to break Egwene free. After she returns to the White Tower, she becomes instrumental in freeing Swan and Liana from captivity, and she travels with them and Loghain to Saladar. There, she makes a point of being honest with Elaine and protecting that relationship before she goes to Rand. Then the concern becomes that her storyline becomes secondary to Rand's, that she doesn't have her own goals that are separate like Elaine and Avienda do. Here is where I have to be most passionate in defending Min, because I see a lot of people arguing that what she does is not important because it is all in service of the goal of supporting Rand. My very strong feeling on this is that there are times in everyone's life where you have the choice where you may have to put your own needs secondary to someone else's. For some people, these times might be very brief and of minor significance in your life overall. For other people, it might be enormous. But I think it is very wrong to discount the importance of what someone does because it is in service to someone else. Imagine, for example, a person who becomes a caretaker for a loved one who becomes sick or has a disability. Sometimes those circumstances are thrust upon us and the choice is either to step up for that person or to shift responsibility to someone else. But it is a choice and I believe Min makes that choice as much as anyone in this story does. In her case, she wasn't abandoning a throne or another major goal or responsibility to do so. She does put her needs second to the man she loves for a time and she does become his support person. But there is value in that, especially given what Rand has to do. Lesser characters would have been destroyed by playing that role, but Min was not. Rand needed someone, and Min was both selfless enough and capable to do it. It's not flashy, and it's kind of thankless, but having someone who Rand could really trust, who would be totally honest with him, who would remind him of who he was, make him feel human again, and make him laugh at times, That was meaningful, and I have no doubt it made some impact. What would Rand have come back for in that moment on top of Dragon Mount, if not for that love? 
And could a sexy lamp have done those things? Now, I do wish that we had gotten to see her struggle to accept that choice a little bit more, but the actual choice I support. Now, does that mean that I think Min needs to be secondary to Rand for their entire lives? No, not at all. Presumably, after the series is over, Min is free to make whatever choices she wants. I'll use an example that I think a lot of people are familiar with, but Lord of the Rings spoilers. Samwise Gamgee is 100% Frodo's support person. That is his role in that book. Now he gets to do a few flashier things like break Frodo out of a tower and carry him literally at one point, but I don't think anyone would diminish Sam's importance in that story. I think that could partially be because Frodo is at times a more passive hero than Rand is, but a lot of people would argue that Sam is the real hero in that story. And I give Min a similar amount of credit, even though that's not to diminish the many other heroes in the Wheel of Time. But when that series is over, Sam gets to go marry Rose and have a bunch of kids and live his life. So then the question becomes, did Min's efforts actually have any impact? Some people argue that Min actually wasn't all that effective. Rand still went crazy anyway, and her visions didn't do that much, and her research wasn't that important. I do wonder if these people were expecting her to like literally carry him at some point or jump on him to stop him from making a bad decision. Of course, Min is not going to completely stem the tide of Rand's madness on her own. But Rand walks the edge for a long time. So even small differences can matter at that point. Imagine that he doesn't have that sense of love in his mind from Min and Elaine and Avienda. Imagine that he doesn't have Min there with him to strengthen it and remind him that he has someone he can trust. There are countless moments that could have gone off the rails without that little bit of difference. Most crucially, as I already mentioned, that moment on top of Dragon Mount, I really think would Rand have pulled himself back at that moment and remembered that there's something that makes it worth trying again, if not for Min. But let's look at some other moments where what Min did might have tipped the balance in Rand's favor. She hits Semerhog with a knife when she's trying to capture Rand. Sure, she doesn't kill her, but she probably made a difference in Rand not getting captured. And where I think Min really shines, though, and finds her calling is as a scholar. All that reading that she does throughout the series is in service of something. And say what you will about her research, but she does share it with Rand. And that is directly related to him deciding that he needs to break the crumbling seals on the Dark One's prison. And it also becomes a piece of what he uses to figure out how to use Kalendor. Again, might not be flashy, and I think some people were hoping or expecting that she would figure some of these things all out on her own and present it to Rand, but that might have spoiled the reveal there at the end with Kalendor. But most importantly, it was communicated to Rand, her research, and it became a part of him figuring it out. He didn't do it all on his own. Plus, Min plays an important role in keeping the Shan Chan on his side during the last battle, so that shouldn't be overlooked either. To sum up, where I think Min's arc falls a little short of where it ideally should be is that her arc is not as dramatic as some others. We don't see as much character development for her over the course of the series. Who she is at the beginning is pretty close to who she is at the end. I think it would have helped to see her struggle more to come to terms with her place in the pattern. Part of that is the amount of page time that she has compared to some others. She has 35 POVs over the course of the series, whereas Elaine has 83, Egwene 130, Rand 236. Though, to be fair, Avienda only has 23. And I would argue that Avienda's arc is a little stronger in spite of that. The bottom line here is that I think the majority of what Min does throughout this series is emotional labor. And that's something that women do all the time and that gets completely overlooked. It is hard, draining, brutal even at times. We have this tendency in fantasy stories in particular to value things like ruling and fighting, whether it's physically or with magic. These are the things that we think make a strong character, and they can. 
But we should also recognize that these are also more traditionally masculine pursuits, and that undoubtedly plays a role in why we value them more than we do traditionally feminine roles. And look, if Min were the only female protagonist in The Wheel of Time and that was her role, it would be a problem, but she isn't. This is not a story where women don't rule and don't fight. We have a whole range of significant female protagonists making a whole variety of life choices. And we shouldn't devalue men's choices because they're not Elaine's or Gwen's or anyone else's. I'm asking everyone to look beyond the obvious of what makes a strong character. Imagine that you were in men's shoes in the myriad of situations that she has to deal with and ask yourself if you would hold up as well or would you break? And then ask yourself if she's strong. And if those shoes she chooses are high-heeled boots worn over tight pants, you get it, girl. Look, I know if you were personally profoundly disappointed in Min's story, I probably didn't change that feeling for you, and I get it. Everybody gets to have their own response, of course. But I hope I gave you some things to think about. So let me know in the comments what you think. I look forward to reading them as always.